Coming up, we've worked hard to bring you another great episode. You know what would make my day? If you listen, yes, but you can really make me smile by subscribing. You can go to offthenose.com or on whatever platform you're using right now. They all have that little subscribe button. Go there right now, click that, and boom, happy Kelly. If that's not enough, you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Insta and Twitter. You can share the episode with your friends or colleagues. So many options to show your love. But let's just start simple and subscribe today, right now. Don't put it off. You guys rock. Hey everyone, on the show today, we have an awesome guest who is going to inspire, motivate, and jump you right out of your seat to go change your life. I guarantee you, Travis Fox is on the show today. It's Dr. Travis Fox because he has a double PhD in psychology and hypnotherapy. He is the author of several books, including the latest Architect That, He has the Architects of Being Online Academy, and we all can go and learn and within 30 days really be living a more fulfilled life. But on today's show, you will get some freebies. So let's jump in to our awesome, motivating, over-the-top, let's go live life conversation with Travis Fox. You gotta get it how it goes now. You gotta take it off the nose. It's off the, it's off the nose. Gotta get back in control now. Let's stop believing in ourselves. It's off the, it's off the, it's off the nose. Good morning, Travis. Excited to have you on. Super excited to have you on. I Thank needed you. you in my life um, a few years ago. I was CEO of a large company and could have used your brain power and I'm super excited to hear about hypnotherapy, which you have a PhD in. And so, yeah, could have used some of that um, psychology on some of my less than uh, creative or motivated salespeople back in the day. But um, I know even day to day, you know, your inspiration, your motivation, the outcome of what you do affects people day to day. So you have been author and a mental coach to athletes. Um, You've worked with uh, just tons of different groups, companies, like I said, athletic organizations. So excited to get into all of that. But, you know, it seems like the basis is in your education. It, It seems like it starts there and you do have a PhD in psychology and clinical hypnotherapy. So I wanted to start by going back. Now, you don't have to tell us how far back we're going, Travis, but little Travis, how did little Travis know, you know, that college was even the route? Because this show is called Off the Nose. So we say there's lots of routes to personal fulfillment. So how did you decide to go to college and then further to get not one, you little shit, but two PhDs. <laughs> okay. Don't have that behind my name. So just walk us through your childhood and uh, who inspired you? Uh, walk me through my childhood. First of all, thanks for letting me be on the show. Uh, <laughs> secondly, um, I have no problem talking about my age. Um, I am just shy of the 50 mark. I turned 50 in November of this year. Um, I am still little Travis. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a 16-year-old trapped in a 50-year-old body, but I, I still act like I'm 16 most of the time. My life was um, my life's kind of an, an eclectic quilt uh, of experiences, and probably because you know the, I've, I've just been around been around a lot of stuff from a very young age. I, I, I was uh, as I always say, you guys call it off the nose. We call it the deep end of the pool. I was in the deep end of the pool almost the time I arrived. Uh, I was born in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I was whisked off within, uh, you know, a month or two off into Japan. So I spent the first, you know, almost four years of my life growing up in Japan. Um, Wow, that's like a joke that I used to say, you know, what if I dropped you in Japan? You literally got dropped in Japan. I got dropped in Japan. And so I was a, I was a gaijin growing up in, uh, in Japan, but it taught me uh, the great history and the great culture of that country um, and deep respect 
um, because it's been that way for, you know, for obviously centuries and going all back to the samurai. And then from there I came back and I was, I was about a year in Florida and my father, uh, who was kind of this avid mediocre athlete, right? He just was kind of good at everything, but not great at anything. He was a typical Michigan farm boy, um, fighter pilot, but he loved golf. For some reason, golf was his thing. And he put a golf club in my hand at five and it was natural to me. I just, I just kind of got it. And then I was whisked off to Germany for three and a half years. Um, and then by the and time how I, were was, you? I was uh, just rolling five at the time. And so we're rolling six now. So now I come back and we're around nine, I'm around nine, nine and a half years old. And we're finally back in the United States. And so there's this kind of this beautiful culture shock of like, what's McDonald's? I grew up on sauerkraut and sushi. I, what the hell is a McDonald's? This is great. <laughs> I'm like, this is fantastic. And so <laughs> That you know, could have gone one of two ways. I, yeah, I, yeah, well, I you know, wish we didn't, you would have said it sucked, but whatever. Yeah, okay. Right, well, at least we didn't, go super, yeah, we didn't do the super size me and we didn't go that hell route from that old documentary. But yeah. um, I, became, I became an avid golfer. Uh, golf became this kind of you know, psychological thing for me. It was like playing chess with myself. And so it's been fascinating because, again, playing chess with yourself, you already know your own moves. And, but then something very unique happened. I think a lot of your listeners probably have experienced this. I know I did. Um, a lot of my, my peer group during that time, my life was kind of planned out for me at that point. My father was convinced and that was, everything was about golf. I was going to be a PGA tour professional golfer. That was the plan. I was going to, you know, I played golf in high school all the way through captain, the team, MVP, blah, blah, blah. You know, and you loved summer. it. Um, I thought I did. Did you uh, love it because it. you wanted to please your dad or now that you're well, a PhD in psychology and you can look back. Yeah. Wait, well, you know, you're, you're cheating. You went a couple chapters ahead. So <laughs> <at the time> <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've looked back, but. Oh no, you're, 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 you're coming up to the pivotal point. The crisis, the, the ah, second act okay. is about ready to happen. Sorry, keep going. And, um, my coffee hasn't quite kicked in yet. So I'm going to catch up here in a second. Uh, <laughs> long story long, I decided to become a father uh, my senior year in high school. And that immediately changed my life. And it changed my life. If you've ever been a, a young parent out there, you understand that that your world instantly changes. None of that. It went. I went through a massive heartbreak. I was not emotionally prepared for the upheaval that happened in my life, and I went from instantly having my life planned out to instant basket case, just gone. And I went to the psychology department and said, you know, I need to fix my head because my golf career is going down the drain like now, and I need to solve this. And the model that they wanted to do me with is more of a Freudian or a Gestalt model, which is great. But I didn't really care about talking about my mom or dad. I wanted to well, why I'm standing on the golf course and thinking all these negative thoughts and where the hell are they coming from and this doubt and this insecurity. Well, that's not me. And yet clearly it was, but I had no clue of origin or where it came from in the, in the deep recesses of shadow. And I met my mentor and uh, he changed everything for me. And I knew the moment I met him that that was the day my life was going to change and my entire career path changed. And yes, to credit, about three years later, as I was getting ready of finishing my bachelor's, I realized that two things occurred. I loved helping other people wake themselves up and not me doing it because one of the things I don't like about therapists or coaches and they say, well, I'll do it for you. That's a load of crap. You don't do anything for people. You help them give them a blueprint, which is what Architects University is all about. But you really guide them to it by walking alongside them. And I really appreciate what he did with me. He made me do the work and I did it. And long that way, I came to the realization that my relationship with my father was completely and solely based on golf. And I like golf. I ended up coaching on tour, a golf channel, infomercials. I've done all that and it was great. My dissertation was on golf, but I don't love golf and you got to love it to play at that level. Um, and I, I turned pro for a little while and found out I was a miserable a-hole. Uh, I'm an ex-perfectionist, OCD, slightly Asperger's individual trying to perfect a game that can never be perfected. It was a perfected. very frustrating square peg round hole thing for me. And when I let go of golf as a way of life, this other path showed up when I finally got out of my own way. And then here we are now, 30 years later. Uh, you now, know, pause there a second, Travis. Because yep. that sounds so smooth and seamless. Well, um, it was 30 years later. <laughs> <laughs> But when you had that realization, uh, yeah. you could have been a lost soul. You could have gone down a dark path because a lot of people, especially in sports, yeah. they become the sport, right? Yeah. That's who That's they are. Identity. That's their whole identity, Absolutely. right? You can, and you can parlay that into business. A man is his identity as the breadwinner. And when they face adversity or lose a job. So you're saying that there was a mentor right there? At that, oh, yeah. at that fork no. in the road? I, I would, a mentor is probably an understatement. Uh, father figure, um, Shidoshi, um, Obi-Wan, pick, pick something that is more iconic. Uh, I sat under Doc for 15 years. Um, 
And uh, if he said jump, I said how high. If he said go speak at this place, I went. If it said get on a plane, travel 20 hours, I want you to do that, I did. And while he wasn't dictatorial that way, he was always inviting me to do one thing, which was expand all of the sciences that we know up until this time from what we knew. And said, but Travis, I, you have a unique gift. He goes, I want you to take it from just straight education to edutainment. People learn in emotional states. They don't learn logically, which is why I wrote school, which is what we all went through, wash, rinse, repeat. Really, you forget most of your stuff. You don't learn it in an emotional state. He goes, I want you to master where you can throw someone in an emotional state and they learn it, bang, and it absorbs in their, in their, in, in their DNA. And that's really become the impetus for everything we've done for the last 30 years. And of course, you know, I have thousands of students and graduate students who teach now around the world who do the same concept. But the difference is, it was all about, instead of using hypnosis as what we most likely cognitively are aware of, you know, what you see in film, if it's the watch or look deep into my eye or all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, I'm That's excited. Not, I have a yeah. couch ready. Uh, you're going to put me under. Well, well how, do you know you're not, how do you know you're not already? <laughs> this is true. Uh, <laughs> That's the trick, right? That's Most the people trick. are like, oh, okay. you're gonna, you're, yeah. Ooh, you're going to do this to me. I'm like, well, you're already doing it to yourself, actually. I'm just I coming alongside and just doing what you're doing naturally. And that's what really became the impetus for the, the, you know, the, the real shift in the academy. And it was about, uh, about 15, 16 years ago, there was a massive shift where I started to realize you know, this mindset training and mind coaching and you know, positive mental attitude a la Norman Vincent Peale in his book in the 50s. And all that was great, but it really didn't get to the heart of the matter. It didn't create the dynamic shift it was temporary, and I noticed that what we've all become very addicted to is addicted to the search. We're addicted to finding our partner and finding our passion and finding the next thing that's going to make us feel something, and that's really the addiction. And people are, are, are starting to wake up to the concept of timeout. <laughs> that's part of a program that's been instilled in us almost since middle school and sometimes elementary that you know, you got to go out there and find yourself. Well, what do you mean find yourself? Do like you leave yourself at a bus stop? What do you, that makes no sense. But at an unconscious sequencing and how we're, how we're built anatomically, it's a program. And it creates this thing called emotional compulsion. We are emotionally compelled to go search for something. Yet we have no idea what we're searching for. We hope to God we stumble upon and go, oh, that's it. But 99% of the time, it's not it. It's just this quick endorphin squirt, this kind of adrenaline pop. And then we get addicted to that adrenaline thing because the lows are so low and we're still not really in that, I hate to use the term, but we'll use it, fulfilled state, even though we actually are. We've created the illusion that we're not fulfilled and that addiction keeps us so cyclical in our relationships and businesses, entrepreneurial, online, offline, you know, these fear mechanisms that we'll never find our match. We'll never find our soulmate. We'll never find our true purpose and calling. And it's, it's hogwash. And that's where the hypnosis comes back in going, People, it's not me needing to hypnotize you to become something. It's actually using hypnosis for you to stop doing what you're doing because you're already hypnotizing yourself every single day and you don't know that you're doing it. And that's what he really taught me and trained me on. That's what the Academy is all about. And so what was his, uh, what were his credentials? Oh, he's a doctor his too. background? He, yeah, he was, he was a PhD psychology, clinical hypnotherapist, Reiki master. I mean, he really spent most of his life traveling and studying with other masters, something homage that I'm actually doing myself now, or I'm sitting with other masters, Qigong masters, Tai Chi masters, energy healers, just learning, because at that level, it's an absorption of learning, and it's not totally. competitive, it's not, oh, my stuff's better than your stuff, and my lightsaber is bigger than, no, that crap, that's back when you're you know, trying to make a name for yourself and you think you're important. I, I kind of gave, gave up on that model, because I'm like- We're past the ego? Yeah, well, God willing, yes. Yes. <laughs> my, my ego says I'm past my ego. I'll put it back. <laughs> but theoretically, I've, I've, you know, I've come to the realization, even then, so much so as like with doctor, you know, 99% of the time, if you call me doctor, you probably are not familiar with me. Now, I have the right to call myself doctor, but I'm not licensed anymore. I don't have any of that stuff. Anymore. I don't care. Doctor, when I looked up the etymology of the word, was really from a derivative word of Latin, meaning teacher. And then I really got to ask myself this powerful question when I was in my mid-30s, which was, Am I worthy of the title of teacher? Am I really teaching anything except ah. for what they taught me? And so I spent the next five years uh, and I retired and stopped and said, you know, I don't know that I'm worthy of the title teacher. I think that's an arrogant comment, especially, you know, when I'm just repeating what other people taught me and my experiences, but is that really teaching? So I spent five years and I traveled around the world and sat with uh, great masters, great teachers, great spiritual leaders. Phenomenal. And said, yeah, what is the meaning of life? What am I missing in this academy? I can teach this. I got it down to a science. I'm very good at it. I've done, done it thousands of times, but it, something doesn't quite feel right. And, you know, if you've been in part of your life, you're like, 
You know that feeling. I don't have to describe it to you. You just know something's off. Yep. You can't put your finger on it. And then I came to the awareness that the whole model that, um, that he had taught me was, yeah, it was clinical and it was designed that way and it was designed how to apply it. But the experience was the part that he said, Travis, you have to create your own path on that. You have to create the experience so that people can apply it. They can understand what's happening and then they can change their life and then they can become the architect of their life. And that's where we are now. And so when I realized timeout, um, we don't teach heart. We're afraid to teach it. We don't want to teach that in clinical. We want to teach all mind, 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 mind. I'm like, wait a minute. The mind is a transmitter receiver. It's just a tool, even going all the way back to the Egyptians. And I've been to Egypt. I've been to the Valley of the Kings. I've sat there and looked at them and said, wait a minute. When they did that whole embalming thing, they took all <laughs> the organs out. They cracked the back of the skull and pulled the brains out through the nostrils, which is a morbid thing, but they did. But yes. the one thing they left in the Pharaoh's body was the heart because they felt that that was what guided him through life and would guide him in the afterlife. I'm like, well, there's some pretty good strong wisdom some 6,000 years ago that maybe we got the sequence all wrong. Right. Which is why, you know, if you look at our logo, it's an inside out job. So hypnosis now becomes the gatekeeper of how are we hypnotizing ourselves? How are we creating these belief structures? How are we keeping ourselves doing these things over and over again and convincing ourselves that we want to when we know down inside we don't really want it. It doesn't feel right. We don't want to be in that relationship. We don't want to be in the, doing the job that we're doing. We're doing have tos and we're convincing ourselves every single day that we have time, that we have time to do it, which is total hogwash. I mean, especially now in today's world with C-19, it's like, it's right in your face. Hey, look, you're going to leave the planet, period. That's the only truth on the planet we're all going to agree on. <laughs> Nobody gets out alive. That Nobody. might be the one thing. That's the only thing. I've traveled the world. I've asked every major religion. I've sat with theologists. I've sat with other great map doctors, far smarter than me. And I said, hey, what's the deal? And the only thing I came up with after reading all the books, looking through this thing, sitting with thousands of hours, I went, the only thing we could all agree on is we're not leaving the planet alive. And that life without living is the ultimate undoable regret. Regardless of your religious belief structure or reincarnation or universal mind or theory of one, it doesn't matter. You're not leaving alive. So the question is, are you ready to really live? And the only way to look at that is to unwind the hypnosis that we do to ourselves, starting with the most powerful one is the addiction to the search, and two, that we have time. We treat time so frivolously and so ridiculously that we just spend it doing stuff that really robs us of the richness of it. And I put people in perspective this way, and I'll ask all your listeners this question, yourself excluded. And it kind of just snaps you right to the moment. It is, you know, if you only had 30 days left to live on this planet, would you be doing anything you're doing right now in right. your life? If your answer is no, I say that wake all the time. up, right. wake up, right? But if you don't know how to wake up, then you are subject to the whims of a man-made mind, your own. Yes, I agree. So how, how much of your literal degree, because a lot of the show I like to, um, you know, we want people to wake up. We want people to live fulfilled lives. We want them to live off the nose lives. A lot of that is, um, can be seeking the education mm -hmm. that can help them go down a new path. Absolutely. So how much of psychology and what exactly is hypnotherapy? So Clinical hypnotherapy, hypnotherapy. Yeah. is it just yeah. what I think it is? That is. What, what, what do you what do you think it is? <laughs> well, hypnosis. I mean, you know. The, yeah, everyone thinks hypnosis is what you see on, on Hollywood, you know. And I'm, you know, 30 years ago, I had the same, you know, vision. Look at the watch, you know, or it's Dracula just taking some young innocent woman and snapping his eyes, and she just, oh, whatever you say, Dracula. Man, if it was that easy, shit, the world would be a different place. I, I'd have, I'd have a totally under control. Sign up for that. Yeah, I'll go wait yeah. in that line. Yeah. I, I'd have that totally under control. I'm like, pop, let's go. Right. Okay. Yeah. And um, if, hypnotherapy is a completely different model. It's actually a brainwave. Everybody has the brainwave. You know, you have four basic brainwaves, beta, alpha, beta, and delta, right? And theta is where hypnosis occurs. And it's kind of that awake and asleep state at the same time. The difference is you're bypassing the conscious guardian defenses. You know, the, the conscious mind in and of itself has these kind of seven rules, which also work against us more often than not. And it's designed to be a defense mechanism. That's its job. Otherwise, you would take in all of your sensory information and it would overwhelm you. You would have no idea how to process it. It would overwhelm your senses. And you can see some of that in an autistic. I, I know I'm an autistic father. So I, I watched my son go to the sensory overload because the system itself, which is electrical based, obviously, your nervous system, your parasympathetic, your sympathetic systems, we're electrical creatures, but we, we, get, we get so overwhelmed we can't process. So the conscious mind helps guard that. 
Well, the downside is it also helps us keep us in our own prison of our own mind and it'll turn itself against us, downside. Hypnosis allows us to do go around that. The difference is when we go back to the educational sequence, what we do at the Architects of Being Online Academy is I actually teach you how it works. I'm gonna show you experientially, we call it the jump training. We're gonna jump right in. You're gonna jump into the deep end of the pool. You're gonna 21 days. You're gonna go through jump one, two, and three, come jump certified. You're gonna experience change in your life realistically. You see clinical, applicational, and then you can experience it. And then we're gonna take you to architects and training, which is the first four modules for you to graduate, which when you graduate through the academy, it's, you know, I hate to use the term, but it's, it's like become, getting a PhD in a year. You don't really get a PhD because that's not how it works, but it's, we take all the frivolous crap out that you don't need and get to the point. And after 30 years, I've refined it, so it works, and we know it works. You go through those first four modules, then we're going to teach you how the experience you just had at the jump actually works. What are the rules of the conscious mind? How does a subconscious belief system actually work? What are the power of word sequences and psycholinguistics? How do we make that work? And we break it down into a fun way. It's interactive learning. Our academy is completely interactive, so it's not just watch a video, hope to God you got it. It's actually interactive sequencing. You're learning, you're touchscreen interfacing, you're taking quizzes, you're working with your architect advisor because the whole process is we start with you. You are the so one. So they're going through their own crap. Oh, absolutely. Because that's the number one thing. I, and, I'm a, and all you life coaches out there, I love you dearly, but knock it off. When we come to the place that you have all the answers, shut up. You don't. I'm the first, I'm the first person that goes, I don't have any answers, but I got really good questions. I got an architectural blueprint that you will come to your own truth. See, coaches tell you what to do. Life architects tell you how to do it step by step because we don't do it. We do everything with a blueprint. But why do we have a blueprint for ourselves? I mean, we're the single longest relationship we're ever going to have in our life is with us. We're stuck with us. And yet yep. we have no idea how to manage the, our brain, our thoughts, where they come from. Why do I think that stuff? How come I feel it? How come I keep beating my head against the wall and think it's going to become a door? I know I'm a how-to guy. Remember, I'm an ex-basket case. I'm the perfect teacher for this. I, I, I was that guy. I went through you it. You said X. Yeah. Well, X meaning that I understand that being a basket case is a choice. I can choose to go be neurotic if I want to, or I can not choose that. And I can ex explore that experience. So when I say X, meaning I'm now in power of the choice. Whereas before as a basket case, it was, I was on autopilot. You want to talk about hypnosis. It would just show up. And I was like, Oh, I'd go down a rabbit hole and I'd be crying one minute. I'm angry the other. And I'm like, Holy crap. There's not enough medication for Travis Fox on this planet. This guy needs to numb out. Right? So and when you look at it from that perspective, you go, wait a minute, how come we haven't given people a blueprint? Why don't we, why don't we spend it? So I've spent my whole life developing this because this, this is my passion. I love, I'm addicted to watching people wake themselves up. There's nothing better than when someone in the room goes, I'm the architect. I can create whatever I want. I'm like, yep. Totally. I, I, I think I agree that the best part of running a, a $200 million company as I did was when I saw some seeds that I put in somebody and I saw their success. Yeah. yeah. That's it's a killer it, drug. man. It's killer. You know, screw the, the, the bottom line. I mean, it mattered, but the well, numbers and and reporting to the board, <laughs> that didn't get me excited. It was, right. it was those moments. So I right. totally, I totally see what you're saying. You yep. know, you, you take, um, I went some th through some stuff with my older son mm. and I went to a, a psychologist mm. and I always thought I was too smart to need a psychologist because oh, yeah, I only nut, only only nut pops and crack crazy people need you know psychologists. Yeah, and I w I considered myself well read and and more importantly aware, very mm -hmm. open and aware. And I always wanted other people's opinions and thoughts, and I would kind of take it in and then form my own. So. I, it was a pretty desperate time and I sought a psychologist, but you know, at first I thought this is a bunch of mumbo jumbo and she's not telling me what to do. Right. What the, f you know, I'm right. paying you $250 for 40 minutes and by God, we ended at 40 minutes. Oh yeah, time's up. <laughs> I could be ready to jump off a bridge and we ended at 40 minutes. And so true. It, it was crazy, but I will say, what I started doing is I started asking her about the um, clinical, the way my brain worked. I started asking her that. And once she started talking from that perspective, she got me. Then I found value in mm -hmm. that, that exchange. Yeah. And that, for me, that's a beautiful story. So now take that and expand it 
and you go through architects and training, architect and mastery, where you can actually take it and you help other people architect their life and their lifestyle. You don't do it for them. You teach them how to become aware step by step and you guide them and their natural message, their natural brand, you know, um, and you may, I think you'd agree with this. One of the things that I, I crack up all the time now watching in social media is these isms that people put out on the platforms of you've got to be the light and you've got to shine your light. I'm like, oh hell, that's like asking the sun to be sunny. What the, what? That what makes is it no even? sense. I it know. Is, that's the, to me, that's the psycho babble BS that people are hypnotizing themselves to believe that is real. Okay, time out, people. If the sun is the center of the solar system and it's always on, even when the earth turns around, you see that little thing called the moon, a reflection, right? That means you too are very reminiscent of that same concept. You can call that being whatever you want, your spirit, your soul, your chi, your Allah, Yahweh, Jesus, I don't care. I'm not here to tell you what to call it. We call it architect for simplicity. That's the part of your being that came into this world and is going to leave this world. Whatever you call that's up to you. We call it architect for simplicity. But it's already light. It already is enlightened. It is already connected to all that is and ever was, will ever be. It's the disconnect between that being and your human brain being. That's the challenge. So it's not about becoming more light. It's about becoming less layers and lenses. Now, those layers and lenses represent anger and guilt and frustration and resentment and shame and not worthiness and not good enough and I'll never make it or whatever that you've put on your light like sunglasses that dull you. But if you don't know how to take those off, which we don't teach people, because my I'm hell bent to change the educational system here in the United States, and I'm already oh my god, okay, let's it talk drives that. me nuts. I'm it like sucks. these skills need to be taught at middle school and high school as a life skill, and we're already infiltrating the school systems now. Going stop. Our jump program is already being infiltrated in the schools. It's been syllabatized so that a 10-year-old to a 17-year-old can escalate through the jump, learn how to make a decision versus a choice, learn how to listen to my guts versus the phenomenal. ideology of my brain. And it finally is starting, the system is finally starting to crack, thank God. And I know this sounds odd, forgive me, family, but C-19 is the first thing that got the educational system off its a-hole to do something. And that's driven me nuts, so I am hell-bent to train um, a million architects in the next five years worldwide and infiltrate the educational system to go stop. These basic life skills, psychology, hypnotherapy, NLP, whatever modality you want to call them, but it's a very step-by-step -step progressive system so that they listen, listen to the essence of who you are. We all know and we all teach our kids, well, just follow your heart, son or daughter. And then we chastise them and go, well, that was dumb. And I'm like, wait exactly. a minute. Exactly. You just gave them conflicting instructions and you wonder why they're a mess and they end up in the psychologist's office. Duh, you should go with them. Stop yes. being so arrogant, right? I know I'm a three-time father and a grandfather. Believe me, I get it. <laughs> I've got neurotypicals and I've got autistics. I got both ends of the spectrum. So I understand from the perspective, do I have parenting down? Nope, not a clue. I, I'm still making crap up as I go. My oldest one is 33 and he's a lawyer and he's brilliant. And my youngest one is 17 and is autistic. Just as brilliant. Just different perspectives. Totally. So what if we change the education system? Well, the Architects Academy is all about that. But the number one thing I see and what I don't understand, Kelly, is people go, well, wait a minute. I only invest in those things when I need, like you said, a trauma, desperate times. Time out. When you're already there, you're already in stasis. You're involved and enveloped in the full hypnotic experience of your belief structure, blown. Emotional, psychological, physiological, spiritual, you name it. Wait a minute. Doesn't it make sense for us to have these skills at all times? Because if you're the architect of your life, have you, are you really architecting the life that you want? And I'm not talking about, you know, think it in the fall of the damn sky. I'm not talking about the law of attraction. Most people don't even know the law of attraction has nine other laws underneath it that actually govern it. That was the secret to the secret. They didn't tell you the secret. That's the joke. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I produced the sequel film. I know yep. a little bit about that too, right? So yep. <laughs> that's good. Beyond the Secret came out this year where we went, time out. There's a whole lot more gone underneath here. What if we all got together and well, let me tell you what we've learned in the last 20 years and that it's not this think and show up thing. And so that was kind of fun to just kind of open that up and go, how about we just share that from a cooperative space now? Well, why, why, don't, Go ahead. Why, do, why do we assume that we come out of the womb and we have to work on all these other things, but we don't put any attention to our mental health? Oh my gosh, I love you. Um, I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That has been my question for 20 years. Wait a minute. If you're the single longest relationship in the world and you are this being, regardless of your religious structure, pick one. I don't care. You all say the same right. thing. I've studied every single one of them and they all say the same thing. You are an enlightened being from somewhere. All right, fine. We're all star people because we're all carbon based and carbon doesn't come from, you know, earth. It came from a collection of stars. So we're all star people. Let's start with that. All right. So if you're this being and you come into this body 
called your humanness and you experience it and you leave the body behind. It's kind of like a spacesuit you leave at, you know, at the theme park. You come to hang out life for a while, but you got to give the body back. Well, if you're this enlightened being, how come we don't spend time doing that? How come you have to be relegated into an orange you know, suit and a robe and shave your head to be spiritual? It makes no right. sense. None. But yet we'll play, we'll play spiritual one or two days a week. And then the other five or six days, we're lost in our head. And it makes no sense. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm not talking about turning this into a religious ideology. I'm talking about the blend that you are a being having a human being experience. And it is the blend of those two. And what if you learn the skills that negotiate so that the being is running the show and not the mind? Because the mind is going to stay here on planet Earth. And again, go all the way back and harken back to the Egyptians. The brain got kicked out. The first thing they did was crack a hole in the back of the pharaoh's head and pull the brains out through the nose. Hey, man, guess the brain wasn't that freaking important. And their society has lasted almost 7,000 years. So I'm not saying I'm the sharpest tool in the shed, but I can observe. And That's go, a good observation. Maybe they figured something out. Maybe we should just kind of watch that. Right. So oh, that, that became the impetus of what the, what the Architects Academy is about is going, you can be spiritual, whatever that means to you. I'm not here to tell you what that means. But the spiritualness, the being in you is the one that runs the show. You can call that the architect, your heart, your soul. Again, I don't, it's up to you, right? But understanding how that creates belief systems and creates this emotional compulsion in your subconscious and then tells your conscious mind to be on guard and look for those next clues, those next amazing things that we commonly call coincidence, deja vu, heebie-jeebies. We call them mogs. Mogs are moments of grace, that synchronicity where something moments on the inside and something on the outside lined up and you went, oh, maybe I should just follow it. I'm like, okay, that makes life an adventure. And then you get to ask yourself, when did I stop dreaming and exchange it for hoping? And when did I stop creating and exchange it for just doing? And when did I exchange, I wanted to have an extraordinary life to just passing through mediocrity and just hoping for the weekend and you know, paying my bills. When did that happen? And start there and ask that nasty question because that's the moment you get to own your own truth. And then you will see how you are hypnotizing yourself to believe a bunch of stuff you know deep down inside in places you don't talk about at cocktail parties is not true for you. So are, are we born? Uh, I had a great guest on that talked about creativity. He's a creativity mm -hmm. expert. Cool. And he was saying, you know, we are born super creative. Yep. And then all the bullshit starts happening. Amen, sister. And the fear starts building and Imprint the bills stage. and the kids and the, yep. yeah. Oh. And yep. then we, we lose it and we need creativity to solve oh, no, the no. world's we don't problems. Lose it. No, no, no. I beg to differ. If I can adjust that word. We yeah. don't lose it. We stuff it down. We compress it, we suppress it, and we oppress it during Fair. the entire stage of our life. And then we seek to try to fit into middle school and high school. And it starts to rear its ugly head in our mid to late 20s when the pattern finally evokes because our body, which is an emotional being, starts coughing it up. Literally. Yes. Actions, deeds, behaviors, relationships. And that's why the 20s are so tumultuous. Uh. We're just all over the bloody map. And who you were in your 21 and 25 are completely different people. Totally. You know, yeah. So, yeah. We I have a 20 year old. I have a 33 year old. I'm in the middle of it. Yeah, I Just totally get you. God bless you. <laughs> figuring out what path and who am I and, right. you know, putting all these constraints but, but, on him. That's like, a great question. For, take, take this for your kid. Stop asking who you are and go the other way. Ask who you're not. Because we can, we, our brain processes is in the not, right? It processes in the negative. That's what a defense mechanism does. That's what a guardian is. And if you don't know that, go to the architects. We'll go, you can go there first three days. Check it out. You'll experience it in three days. You'll know what I'm talking about. But ask what you're not. We always go, well, who am I? You're anything you want to be. That's the problem. Your brain can't process that big. Our brains are not that powerful. They think they are, which is the ego talking. We're not. But start with something that is tangible. What am I not? Well, what are the basic? Well, Travis, you're not a female. Great. Got that problem solved. Check that okay. box. Got to know that. Right. Okay, good. We're on a track. Well, let's see. Well, you're not, you know, six foot 12. Great. Well, I'm not 400 pounds. Great. Um, you know what? I'm really not liking this or not liking that. And you start narrowing it down and when it's left, then you have this kind of narrow channel of, okay, what do I like? Because we're so conditioned to pain, we're so conditioned to failure, we're so conditioned for hope for the band, uh, hope for the best, plan for the worst. We're already setting ourselves up for this this state of failure, this state of uh, non um, um, acceptance of what we really want. That we spend our lives again back to dictate the search. Well, who am I? Well, you can start with I am and read every major theological text. They'll all say the same thing: I am is who you are. Okay, boom, we're done. Now what? And you're still mentally masturbating, going. 
I don't know who I am. I don't know what I want. Mom. I like that I'm word, mentally masturbating. That's a good yeah. word. Yeah, feel free. It's, it's one of my originals. Knock yourself out. Be, I'm going to take that. It. I'll credit yeah. you though. But Thank you. So, so part of it, I mean, that's a huge part. Just yeah. being able to come to the table and say, I want to be an architect of my own being. I want to own my life. Yeah. And then I want to go through the work that yeah. it takes. And then well, ours is fun. Ours is if you haven't figured that out by now in this interview between me and Kelly, I'm not your typical person. I have a lot of fun with it. I put I'm it in doing the it. Order. Yeah. I'm gonna come back on and talk about it, but I'm gonna do it for sure. Okay. Yeah, I like fun. It. Let's do I it. have to have fun with learning or forget it. Yep. Um, but but what I was saying is it's one thing to bring yourself and say, Okay, I need this, I want this, I'm gonna yep. put the work in. Yep. Then how do how do you fight against all the bullshit in society and the norms and the, so I might come out from the program and I'm like, woo, you know, free as a bird. I've got my wings on. (laughs) I'm ready to go. And then my family's like, she's lost her freaking mind. And and cool. Good for you. It's about time because mine sucks. Right. (laughs) Right. Right. Well, How do you deal with society? Let's look, let's, look at the, let's look at the structure of what you just said. Because this is where, and people really, I always invite people, people say, well, you're, you know, you're, uh, you're not listening to what I said. You're like, you're right. I'm listening to what you're not saying. Because what you're not saying is more powerful than what you say. Because what you're saying is constructs. You're either constructed from a subconscious autopilot or B, you're filtering the words that you're saying to me to make sure that it's conveyed correctly and understood the way you think it should be understood, not the way it's coming across or the other person might perceive you. So example, you said, how do you fight? Which tells me right away, bang, you're already in a defensive posture of what happens if they judge me? Which means we're really judging ourselves because you said it perfectly. What if my family thinks I've lost my mind? Great. What if they think you've kept it? Right? Maybe right. your family is waiting for you to stop holding you back. Maybe your family's excited as hell. Your significant other, I, I don't know your family structure, but let's use your son. Like, maybe your son's finally going, hey, mom, what would be cool if you unshackled yourself and you just went, you know, diva out and you just lost it and said, we're going to go climb mountains. We're going to experience everything. Mom's lost her stuff. But has she? Because lost it according to what? Then you're going to back into what we call the four pillars. Now, we're all the way back to the beginning again. Mother, father, religion, and state are the big four pillars that form some 80% of your subconscious personality. And you have to look at those influences because when we are younger and super creative, credit to your other guests, we are extraordinarily creative. We're naturally creative as kids. We imagine stuff and then we're in it. You know, I'm, I'm 50 years old, so a $6 million man to me is like, na 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 and you're doing this, and, you know, and you're, you're doing this whole thing, and you're playing, and you're in it, man. No one can convince you you're not Steve Austin until your mom says it's time for dinner. Then you kind of snap out of it. <laughs> then you're in it, right? But then all of a sudden, you're right. We start fitting into conformity. We start, we start doing parenting things like no. No is a constant response mechanism that we give as parents as opposed to teaching and guiding. Now, I'm not saying I'm a parenting expert. There are far better people more qualified than me, family. But one of the things I've learned from my autistic was no had zero effect. It had zero effect because no is just a word. No in an autistic's world means I don't K-N-O-W enough of what you're saying to me, dad. I don't know what you're saying, not no. And so when I shifted that, that shift my speech patterns with him, all of a sudden no was eliminated almost from exclusively from my vocabulary. I love because I that. learned to ask questions and I learned to figure out what his emotional sequence was. And then I connected with him on emotion. And now all of a sudden he didn't feel like he was being oppressed and then things were being taken away from him. And again, I'm not talking about, you know, an homage to Dr. Spock in the seventies and kind of just let kids do what they do. I'm talking about connecting at the being level, because let's, let's ask this question, Gilly. In, in, in your world, would you rather have someone come up to you and just give you a bunch of information at a cocktail party and do this you know, kind of rhetoric exchange of how the kids, what are you doing, how's the show going, blah, 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 blah. or someone walk up and you say, you know, Kelly, I'm just really curious, what's the favorite way you sabotage yourself? Because if I ask that question, just like you're dead silent staring at me right now and all your listeners, people go, shit, that's a question. I'm like, yeah, but isn't that what we really want? We really want to connect at that moment. And if you don't want to connect, ask yourself, then what the hell are you doing here? What is your journey to hang out and be disconnected? Okay, that's, that's a journey, okay. But deep down inside in places we don't want to talk about at cocktail parties, we only connect in two ways. 
extreme passion, lust, when we first meet someone we're massively attracted to, or B, in times of tragedy when our, and our inhumanity is when we need our humanity. Well, what about all the other 80% of life? What are we doing? We are numbed out. We are Netflix to death. We are watching the same crap over and over again and scared to death that someone might find out you just want to be in love, you want to be in passion, and you want to experience everything because deep down inside, you don't give a crap about the penthouses or the mansions or the cars or the great things. I had them all. I've done them. You'd rather be on a beach where you have just enough money to get by, deeply, madly passionate in love with your partner and surrounded by a community that wants your best and highest good because that's what it's all about. Because at the end of the days, when you leave this planet, you're not giving a crap about anything except for, I wish I had traveled more. I wish I had I spent wish more time. I, I, wish I wish I wish I had freed myself from the prison of my mind. So let's own it now before Agreed. it's too late. I always say, it's who do I want to be on the side of a mountain naked with? Now take that as you will, but what I mean by naked, I mean- Hey, I naked climbed Kilimanjaro, fun. let's go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm good with it. that too. Yeah, let's but do it, I, I did it. I, I also mean strip away all the bullshit. Perfect. I strip it all away and that's who I want to hang with. You then know? you're going to want to hang with the architects because that's what it's all about. But difference is we come from a space of unconditional. We're all messed up. We all know that we are. We don't come from a place of answers. Me too. Just because I'm the CEO and founder doesn't mean I have it together. I'm on my journey too. In fact, I'm working on my fourth book right now, which is called Blueprint to Healing, which comes out this December. And it's my personal journey of how do we really heal? I've spent 15 years watching people quote unquote heal only to rediscover that it surfaced again, myself included. And I went, wait a minute, this whole adage, and here you want to talk about hypnosis family, time heals all wounds. No, it doesn't. No, it it doesn't. covers them up and makes you forget about it until it right. shows up again. That you is have total to BS. Address it. Total BS. But it's not just address it. It's how do you heal from it? How do you actually create a space where it doesn't bother you anymore? And I'm not talking about you know distraction or disassociation. I'm talking about truly understanding the entire experience that you went through. Because by the way, if life was totally just pleasure all day long, you'd get bored with that too. What you do need to experience of those healings is because we get to expose parts of ourselves that still are deep down to hidden we've forgotten about. Example, I was doing work on one of the book, I'm finishing the last chapter for it, and I went through a process and I was diving, diving down deep then we call master guardians and these are things that have been with you for a very, very long time. And I found one from 24 years ago. The experience itself lasted three minutes, but the emotional sequence of intensity that went through has been in my life uh, concurrently for 24 years. And it took me now here, and plus I'm, I'm the guy that teaches this stuff and I'm still working on it. And I realized that that experience has been undercurrently all the time talking. And it's been in every conversation, every relationship, every business dealing, every interview, everything I've done, it's been there. And I went, wow, that's amazing. And I got to look at what the wound was. Now, in this particular case, it was a self-inflicted wound. And I don't mean physical, I mean emotional. And I looked at that wound and I got to unwind it and start to really understand it. And when I got to the final healing, a bona fide real healing, everything changed. The academy changed, all the students changed, I changed. And then it gives you that question that, you know, the world doesn't revolve around you, but you are the center of your world. Therefore, we have to fix, quote unquote, and I hate to use the word fix because it implies you're broken, but we have to unwind and take those layers and lenses off, as you said so eloquently, strip it down. Otherwise, are we really just walking around on autopilot? And then is, the, is that really life? For me- Can you compartmentalize like this? What's that? Can you compartmentalize this? Can you well, that's say- how you, That's the coping mechanism now, right? That's what you do now. We compartmentalize <laughs> our healing. Well, that was then. You know, I had that relationship. That was my divorce. That was my ex-wife or that was that experience or that whatever, that business dealing, your company. Boom, that was, it. That, I'm done. I've been there. So your office. whole- all parts of your life have to be addressed and, and well, you have, have to, to own it. Yeah, they don't have to be, but they could be. Okay. Right? See, but you, you feel like you're your true, authentic self living a completely fulfilled life if you are addressing all parts. Uh, I'd love to see someone who's completely 100% fulfilled addressing all parts of their life, myself included. I have not met that person. If they're there, I'd like to meet you. I'll be on any plane tomorrow to find that. I've never <laughs> met that person. I've heard a lot of people profess that crap. I know I used to do it too when I was Dr. Fox and thought I knew something. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, time out. I haven't well, met that I, person. I can say for my own life, you know, I'm not good in all areas. Good. Right? I don't want you to be. Do you? But, but do you? you know, I, mean, I do live a life that, I mean, at 48, 
I should have. Oh, come on. You're only 38. Stop embellishing to make me feel better. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, my family thinks I'm nuts. Perfect. I'm crazy like a fox. Totally. And I, and I raise my kids to say there's no set pattern. So tell me about what does your family have to do with this? That's the second time you brought up family to me. That is a judgment sequence for you that you're still running around. So there's a wound there. Probably there is a wound there. I bet you there's four of them. Mother, father, religion, and state culture, right? Where's the culture influence? So you raised your family differently. And I'm quoting my fingers family. For those of you who are not watching the podcast or listening, right? I'm quoting you raised your family differently. According to what? Whose rules? Right. I mean, I think. Oh, that's a question. No, no, time out. That's a question. Society. Society ah, standards. Down. No, you didn't get to know society until you were a little bit older. Your society was mom, dad, oh, religion, so your brothers family. and sisters. Sure. Right? Okay, sure. So, so my what? family said you should go to college. You should follow this route. You should Don't stay with the company. Get the gold pen after 25 years. I was like. Yeah. Okay, well, I am going to fail you. So you're the proverbial free spirit in the family. You're like oh. me. You're the rebel that said, this is dumb. Wait yes. a minute, this 4040 plan so I can get a gold watch, it's fake, and I get my weekends, and I get the two week, and that's life? Nah, I'm out. I'm out. I, I figured that out at 19. I was like, that's a But dumb you know watch. what's funny? You know what's interesting? I see why uh, I still judge these people, and, and I'm and doing this. I'm doing this show and because, yourself? well, you know, judge, that word is... We, no, it's perfect. We, we all don't judge. like that word, but we all judge. Wait a minute. Why don't you like that word? Stay on Well, the some people don't like that word. They think it's a negative. I'm like, you judge things every day. You have to critically judge. That's the way your mind is yes. built. You have to go, yes. hey, that car's coming at X amount of speed. I have to judge the rate of yes. speed times distance. So we or agree. Splat. Right. You what have judgment to judge. means is when we hold a standard against someone else and say, Kelly, Travis says this is the way you need to live. And if you don't, then you are X and I label you, right? That's yes. a judgment as opposed to going, hey, Kelly's a free spirit. Okay, let's go get naked on a mountain. Why? Because I don't know what I'm going to experience. The judgment isn't about Kelly. It's about bringing up the fear, insecurity, and my non-alpha male ego assholeness because I might find out she thinks I'm a tender marshmallow on the inside and that screws up my whole image. It's not the other person we're judging. It's our own internal judgment, but it's easier to transpose and project. But if you reverse that model and go, wait a minute, I'm judging that person. Yes, I am but I'm not externalizing. I'm looking at them as a reflection of where I'm still judging myself and they're giving me a gift to see it in reverse, which is what's on my hat. It's called Mog. Where you look at the person, the person you start to judge, you go, dang, I'm being a judgmental a-hole. Why am I doing that? Oh, because this person's irritating me. Why? Because that's something that I'm still dealing with in myself. Now that's not a new model, but the how you unwind it from there, that's where it gets new in architecting land. And so you get to look at everyone you meet as a reflection of yourself to go, dang, I didn't see how I could be better at that or how I'm still doing this thing over here. And now all of a sudden you start to remember everybody's in the people business. Whatever business you're in, it doesn't matter. You're in the people business. And until you embrace that with this loving concept and this childlike creativity and curiosity, you have subscribed yourself to this ideology of adulthood. Get over yourself. Adulthood sucks. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of time. I know I was an adult from the time I was 20 to 30. And I was a boring individual. I know yes. that's hard to but it sucks. Know like, it all. Yeah. Yeah. You got, your doc, you got all these letters after your name. Who gives a crap? You know, Travis is finally enough. And that's when I'm, you know, people call me Dr. Fox and that's great. Probably because I want a hotel reservation or a dinner reservation. Beyond that, <laughs> Travis is enough. Travis hey, use it enough. when you need to. Uh, you know, when it comes in handy once in a while, it sounds cool at interviews. And when they say, oh, yeah, my God, that's great. Bottom line though, Travis is enough. But it took me 45 years to finally go, stop. I'm Society, mother, father, religious state, still trying to please my dad that I didn't finish my golf career the way he wanted it done. Yes. I finished golf the way I wanted it. I did great with golf. I loved it. I had my experience. And guess what? When I got there, I was like, woo, made the right decision because this is, this is you know, uh, duct, uh, duct tape and bubble gum. This is just another show, but it's not a show that I want to participate in. I love the guys on the tour. They're fantastic friends of mine, but they love it. I don't love it. I love this. I love this. I can, you want to go on a mountain? Let's go. I, again, I, I, I hiked Kilimanjaro at 48 years old, never hiked a mountain in my life. That's Just to me. Say I could do it. Let's go. You want to get on a plane? Let's jam. You know, but that's why when you talk about schools, it, yeah. it, we have a fighting chance at having a society with more individuals like-minded, like what we're talking about, the earlier theory. we start. Yeah. Right? That's, 
That's what we're doing. That's what the jump training is all about for the architecting teens. It's the 10 to 17 year old where we've already got an imprint, but the imprint isn't so stuck in the subconscious that it becomes cemented and, and really kind of lodged as we deal with in our age group in 30, 40, 50, and we're like, we have these midlife crisis and, oh, Travis is going to rob off, we're going to red Corvette and a 21 year old blonde. No, no, stop it. That's just horseshit, right? Stop, right? It's calm down, relax. It's like, let's look at this from a young age because when we know true compass north of ourselves, then the societal thing stops because now it becomes, hey, Kelly, I see that you're working through this. Let me help you. And again, I'm being a little altruistic, but I want to throw that out there because I've done this with kids. I've done it with teens. I've coached teens. I've coached Division One basketball. I've worked with this to go, you can do this when you see it from that point of view, but it unwinds it from a competitive model. We've been in a competitive model for six centuries as a species. It's the dumbest thing that's ever been conveyed on the human history of life. How can you be competitive? We're all on the same damn rock floating around a little nowhere with nobody in our postal zip code in the entire solar system. Maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm just one of those guys that smoked too much pot and danced around a fire naked somewhere, but I did and I went time out. We're all on the same freaking planet and nobody's getting out alive. Maybe we could actually work as a collective and value each one of us because each one of us is a specific. Like you said, I'm not good at everything. I hate the education system because it says, Kelly, you've got to become a well-rounded person. Bullshit. Shit. If you become well-rounded, you roll around and do nothing. You never get anywhere. I want masters who are focused on one thing and they master it. They're dumb as a brick. I'm dumb as a brick at many things. Great, but it makes me a student. It makes me an adventurer. It makes me go, Kelly, teach me something. Tell me, what's it like to be you? What do you, what do you like to do? You want to go climb mountains? We'll go climb mountains. Why? Because I get to learn through your eyes. But my mastership is where I'm at, and I'm secure in that mastership as you're secure in yours because that's what we focused on. That's our passion, our purpose, and our point. We don't need well-rounded people. That creates mediocrity. We need it people does. who have brought their mastership up and that starts with jumping them in when they're 10 to 17 years old and teaching them that each one of them is valuable. And I'm not talking about kumbaya, people who are out there going, well, Travis, you don't understand. The hell I don't. I'm an adopted kid. I understand a lot. I understand a lot more than you think I do. My point is we just throw these kids through the system and say, take a test, pass it, forget that stuff, add a boy, add a girl. Here's some money for your report card. Go get a job. Figure out who the hell you are. Good luck. It's a no joke. wonder why they're all messed up. These kids we are, are not too. prepared. The model doesn't work. So let's so change it. How do you teach them to think big, think as individuals, uh, dig deep, figure out what they like, follow those paths without it being too Montessori-like, without it being almost too many options so well, wait minute, they don't out. know where to go? Because you I kind of address you. that. I love you. Great questions because, damn, finally somebody's asking some questions because I'm getting excited about this. Thank you. First of all, where did we get with this ideology there's too many options? There's always too many. Right now, you, Kelly, you could get off this show with me right now. You have the world at your fingertips. Don't give me that crap. You always have a world of options at any given moment of your life. It becomes about what option aligns with your guts, your architect, your heart. Teaching them how to know that is how you know where to go. Most of the time, we have so many options, we mentally masturbate on every single one of them on what was yes. or what could be, and we don't do shit. We sit right in the middle and spin exactly. in the on our mediocrity. It's the opposite. No, I want you to know that you have all the options. What I want you to be able to understand is which option aligns for you here in your guts, how to do that, how to get out of your own head. Stop going, well, it was like this the last time I did it, and that's why I'm not going to do it. That's my Bill Clinton. I don't know why I went there, but I did. I so, like that. Yeah, here's, here's, yeah, I'm Bill's a grand, I've actually met Bill. But great guy, very charming, but I, and that wasn't disrespectful. The other one is we play this what, will, what could be game. We're at three in the morning. Well, if I did this, and maybe I could do that, and I could become the next Elon Musk. Or the, great. And then you wake up in the morning and do the same stupid crap you did before. So we're constantly bouncing back between what was and what could be. Are you That's saying that we are born with a certain, obviously we are born with DNA, but are we born <laughs> with a certain inclination and cert to do certain things and that we need to tap in to figure out what those are? I think everyone has a particular storyline that they've chosen at a being level, right? Now that storyline manifests in a multiple different ways. And from that process, there becomes a a message, not from a, a, an a altruistic authoritarian point of view, but from an experiential point of view. Again, you can't teach, reflect what you don't know. You can't, it's not possible. 
right? That's like me trying to reflect what it's like to be blonde Kelly at 48 years old. I have no clue. I have zero clue. I can imagine it. I could probably Come dress on up over. And drag. I could dress up and drag and do all that and look beautiful and that'd be great. And I'd still have no clue what the hell that actually means. I'm yeah. just playing it on TV, which is what most of us do. We play on TV all day long. We're all great actors. And believe me. Oh, I've see, I like what you're saying. I like that you're saying because people are afraid to say that. Yep. People are afraid to say that, that you're born uh, with certain characteristics, certain things that you're, that you're, I don't know what the word is. Predisposition to. Certain dispositions sure. that you could be better at, right? And there's yeah. all these cute little quizzes you can take. I, I think they could be somewhat effective for helping nah. a teenager who doesn't really maybe know what he's good at. You know, they just look at where, where can I make money? Where can I get the again. girls? Where? So I got to interrupt you. This is where we start down the road of performance model. What am I good at? I don't care what you're good at. I care what you feel good at doing. What you feel good at doing. Right. So here's the challenge. We spend so much time trying to be good. Mom, dad, give me an attaboy, get, get, get good grades, blah, blah, blah. Maybe get a job. And I go to, uh, same model. Great. What the hell does that mean? Ask some kid how they feel about school. 98% of them go, it sucks. My kids hate school. I, I hate <laughs> school. I think that's why the academy is totally different. Like if you're not having fun, piss off. Yeah. Right? Go, go get, find someone who's going to give you motivational rah-rah stuff. I'm not into rah-rah. I'm into bona fide change. You're going to do the work, but have fun doing it because it doesn't have to be years of therapy. I watched my, you know, my mom go through six years of therapy and two things occur. Mom was still dealing with the issue and the therapist retired. That's bullshit. I thought yep. that was the dumbest model I've ever seen in history. I'm like, wait a minute. Stop. Okay, if we're supposed to, therapy was designed to be an intervention for a crisis situation. You know, it should be like three visits and you're done right? And that way, even better yet, why don't we just teach people how it works? Show them a system, a blueprint, how to have whatever they want. The question is understanding what they want. That's the trick. And it's so what you like to do. So not even like to do, I, you know, I, I like to do podcasts. Great. I love to do interviews. I've been doing it my whole life. I've been on radio my whole life, but I want you to feel what like means to you. Cause like isn't a feeling like is a simile. It doesn't mean anything. What does it feel like to do a podcast? Are you in your passion? Right now, I'm in my passion. If you haven't figured it out, listener, have another cup of coffee. You'll join us here in a second. I don't even think you needed coffee, but yeah. (laughs) I'm a coffee whore. I really am. I love coffee. It's just my thing. (laughs) But nonetheless, my point being is there's a difference between going to find your passion or being passionate about something or being passion. Example, let's go all the way back to the beginning of this conversation. If you only have 30 days left to live, I promise you, You'd be passionate about breathing. You'd be passionate about a kiss. You'd be passionate about talking to a conversation. You'd be passionate about scratching your ass. You'd be passionate about everything because you know it's going to end in 30 days and that's the last time you're ever going to experience it. How come you're so scared, people? And I know I was too. And sometimes I still deal with that. How come we're so scared to be passion all the time? Because when you start to understand the preciousness that life is going to end and you look at that from a base plate of fear, Holy crap, my fear has been keeping me in a box my whole life. I've hypnotized myself to believe that my money, my power, my cars, my sex, my drugs, my rock and roll makes me invincible to death. No, it doesn't. That's total horseshit. You want to know why you're a good hypnotist? Because you believe that you're invincible. That's where you know you've hypnotized yourself. The question is, do you actually know how you did it? Or did your mind just do it for you? Because deep down in places we don't want to talk about, and it rules, rules our, ruins our alpha male. And well, if Kelly finds out I'm a big, not alpha male, and I don't know why I'm doing my country voice, I just kind of am. I like right? this. We, yeah. Thank you. If we do that, it ruins our image. Now, guys, let's cut the crap. This alpha male thing is the dumbest thing in history. Here's why. Totally. Because when we meet a woman, all of us, Every single one of us turns into a big jello head marshmallow babbling (laughs) 16-year-old little boy with pimples on our nose, hoping to God she doesn't find out we're a dork. Hi, my name is Travis Fox. I'm a dork. I'm I'm a a total dork. dork. I screw up every day. I babble. Yes, I'm a professional communicator speaker, but when I'm in that space, when I'm I'm in that world, I'm an idiot. But I want to be one. And guys, you do too. Cut the crap. You want to be in love. So drop the bullshit. And you know what? Because ladies see through it anyways, guys. I'll save you a whole hell of a lot of time. I've been with about my, 68% of my audience is women. I listen to them and I'm like, do y'all see through that? And of course, I've trained architects so they can see through it. And they're like, uh, When well, yeah. you probably don't want to be with somebody who doesn't see through it. Right? Yeah, we'll play that game. Uh, well, you know, we, we, we look good on camera. Yeah. Right. Who, who's filming you? Is it a porn? What are you talking about? What do you we think is really the biggest do- thing that, that hold people back? Is it... The themselves. material desires, or is it the 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 four pill the parents? What is it? 
It's what actually, do you think it's, is a, the it's an architectural thing? of all of the things, you know, at the, at the risk of sounding shamelessly promoting, it is an architectural grid. It is a foundational blueprint of the four pillars. It is played out in through multiple stories and experiences in our lives. The characters change, the experience and the environment shifts, but the base core line structure is relatively the same. And when you look at the architectural code, how do we actually store a memorial experience? It's not stored with, oh, that was, you know, that's grass and those are trees and that's blue sky. That's how your brain presents it to you. But the actual code looks like hieroglyphics. And so when you see a code sequence, no different than a DNA strand, and you start shifting those things and you truly shift it. I'm not talking about NLP. For those of you out there NLPers, I'm an NLP master teacher, trainer, had for years. I don't believe NLP is a behavior modifier. I believe it's a behavior identifier. There's a big difference in those mm. two things. There's levels far deeper than that that we need to look at and then change the emotional sequencing. And then all of a sudden we have a, a real belief shift and a real change or a let go if you want to use that simple. I think it's also too, the material desire is the illusion. I know I'm guilty too. I had it. I had the cars, the houses, the whole, I, I did it family. I, you know, I drive a truck. I drive a truck, right? I drive a, I won't give the name because I don't want to shamelessly blood the show without them being a sponsor, but I drive a truck. I've had the cars. Name the car, I've had it. I have been there. And guess what? I found out that people treated me differently because of the car. It's now all of a sudden I was Dr. Fox. I'm like, what the hell does my car have to do with it? I show yes. up the next day in my truck and I'm just a schmuck. And I went, I'm the same guy that showed up the other day in the Bentley. I'm the same guy that showed up in the Rolls, right? I'm the same guy that showed up in the Range Rover. What changed? Your perception so you, of me changed. Can you well, say that because you've achieved success though? Is that the harder part is when you're on the climb? What are you talking about? I'm still on the climb. So are you. What are you talking well, about? I agree. I I came who, back down the show, mountain. Show I'm starting at the bottom the again. Climb. Even Jeff Bezos is still on the bloody climb. There is never, I've made it. I don't know what you made X, but you're always going to go to Y or to Z. Yeah. Because that's what the brain does. The brain is always seeking to feed the external experience because that's what it's. So you never to get do. there. Where's there? Right. Wherever people think there is. Steve Jobs got there, dead, broke, yep. dead, gone. Everybody dies. Okay. So it's not a there. It's an experience of the journey, but that's an ideologic shift that takes a little bit of scariness from us because it means abandoning what we've been programmed to believe. Your success, Kelly, is based on how many cars you have. Your marriage has got to be 400 years long in one relationship. God forbid you have two because then- Failure. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, you're a failure. Yep, scarlet letter. There, but we knew she was that one, God damn. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. No, I'm like, I, I, uh, I, I want to cre create a whole sequence and then I'm like, it's, it's okay. You got to learn a little bit. Um, yeah. Anyway, we'll get into that later. Then bottom line is we, we qualify. And I know I fell into it too. And it has to look a certain way. Here's the run of the mill though. If you don't know this, go ask. Most people who finally achieve that kind of financial wealth, yeah. there is an imbalance somewhere else. Usually it's in their relationship. It's in the fulfillment of the self or their body has taken such an emotional absolute beating. They've ingested so much shit, so much anger, so much stuff, this competitive model that it kills them. It, Steve Jobs is a perfect example. Now, I'm not saying that his job did that, but come on, family. We all know he's a fairly intense individual. It's, sure. it's not a secret now, right? Go watch the movie, read the book, knock yourself out for those of you around him. Now, that doesn't make him a bad person or a good person. It just means our bodies are emotionally electrical. They're constantly moving. And when we start creating blocks, no different than we dam up a river, over time, it's going to either burst the dam and you're gonna have this massive tsunami effect, or B, it's gonna overflow. But that means the stuff that's at the bottom of the dam never gets to clear. It's only the stuff on the top that clears. So it's like basically, you know, taking a quick breath and gasping and going right back under again. And we do this over and over again. And it's not just because of, you know, I've achieved success, quote unquote. I've had money, I've lost money, I've had money, I've lost money. I've been broke with two rubber nickels and rebuilt my life three times. Guess what? Let me save you a whole boatload of time, family. You're leaving it on the planet. So get over yourself and start living your butt off. Enjoy it. You want to go run naked on a mountain? Do it. You want to stay out midnight and watch the comet that just went whizzing by? Do it because they won't be here for another 6,800 years. By the way, that goes all the way back to the Egyptians last time we saw that damn thing. Agreed. So guess what? The universe, we're just a grain of sand passing through on the beach of God. Enjoy the hell out of it. Yes, you go, Travis, you understand, you got to pay bills. Yeah, do I put a kid through law school? I understand intensely. I know exactly what it means. Oh, Travis, you understand I've been divorced. Yeah, I've been divorced twice, so what? But I'm friends with them. Why? Because I understand that that journey can only go so far. Not because, oh, okay, well, I'm going to go find a blonde or whatever. No, because at that point, the emotional level changes and time is precious. And it's a gift to say to someone, hey, you know what? I love you. I'll always love you. But 
this thing is not feeling right anymore. I don't want to waste your time or mine. And not from a, a, a negative or dismissive point of view, but a loving, unconditional, unconditional yeah. love is so hard to walk. Believe me, family, when people go, well, unconditional love is easy. I'm like, really? I know really? people People call me, okay, Miss Hollywood, because I'm friends with, with my exes and I mean, friends with I their do. girlfriends and I don't see any other way to live. I don't see it as a negative. Nope. It's, I, I don't even know director, why I got married. Director. I love her husband. He's a yeah. director. Yeah, we have a running joke that she traded in a producer, me, for a director. I'm like, slut, <laughs> it's kind of a joke. So we have fun with it. But you know, when I go back and visit her in, in where she lives, I stay with them. The three yep. of us have breakfast. I'm like, you guys do that? I'm like, well, yeah, I love her. I'm, I'm not actively enveloping and, in and love. creating love with her, but yes. I will always love her and I will always cherish the, you know, the 17 years we had together. We were kids. We grew up. We, we protected each other. We were all we had. Why would you say baby in bathwater? Right? But that's what we tend to do because we're very dismissive. And then all of a sudden we go into another relationship. Ironically, it looks almost identical to the one we just had. And then we wonder why it keeps happening. I'm like, because we're the issue. We're so scared to own that we're the issue. Family, so talk about are. ownership. You, yep. you just mentioned ownership. Creating, being the architect of your life does mean owning it. Yep. And, and what's going on in society today, um, I would say there's a lack of ownership. Of and we don't have to, you know, get, you can get as controversial as you want to get. But, <laughs> because I haven't been before. <laughs> uh, right. And <laughs> same here. So, but there's just a lack of ownership. You know, people like to say millennials, they have no clue. They don't know where they are. They need gold stars. They have no uh, accountability for their life. Maybe that's true. I would the true. person that's saying that needs to look in the mirror. Probably. Um, because they're, you know, maybe not following that societal path. And so they want to throw them in this lost bucket. But Or maybe they're afraid that they followed the societal path and they're too scared to just let go of it. Sure. I mean... That for sure. Yeah, simple. Just ask when the question. When you see what's going on today, yeah. what do you what do you think? Uh, I think two things. Uh, uh, one, I think that the idea of competition has now reached pinnacle. We've got to the point where how what competing for what? What what are we competing for? World domination. What happens when you're world dominated? You're going to be dead too. It happens. So your domination is only going to be for a period of time. And if that's your, if that's your get off, okay, good luck. It hasn't worked out really well in history, but <laughs> good luck. All right, fine. So what are we really competing for? I mean, let's be candid. It's not like money fell off the bloody planet. We're printing money now like it falls out of the damn sky. So money's not the issue. It's really about, I think, about the freedom. We believe that we're free. And I'm not talking about the United States. I'm talking about as a species. We believe that we're free. And yet we are so scared to be free. Because real freedom means, okay, at this given moment, uh, I've decided I want to have a kick-ass conversation with this woman, Kelly, and I'm going to go all the way down the rabbit hole un uninhibited, un un unretarding myself and letting myself just be. Here's my transparency. Here's everything that's going on in my world. You, you want to judge a good, bad, right, wrong, that's up to you. But share it. We're so afraid to share because if someone finds out we're vulnerable, vulnerability is a strength family. It's not a weakness, but we have been conditioned that if someone finds, that's a weakness. I know I, I'm, part of my life grew up in Japan, vulnerability in Japan, not cool, super not cool. That goes all right. the samurai thought processing where I'm going, wait a minute, vulnerability is exactly what we all want. We all crave it. We all want to be part of something bigger than ourselves and we're too scared to admit it. And they're scared because someone might find out that the things we thought were important, monies, cars, men, women, gold stars, statues, you know, Emmys, all these things that we think are important. And they're fun. Don't get me wrong. They're great experiences if you put them from a story, from an adventure point of view. But again, going back to what you said, and I concur 100%, I'd rather, I'd rather be like naked on the side of a mountain or, and where I'm really connecting with someone because at the end of the day, that's it. We all know it. We all know it. I don't have to teach you that. Nobody needs to teach you that. You don't need to go to some rah-rah session. You don't need to go to an ashram. You don't need to do it unless you think you do. But realistically, you don't. You know deep down inside in places we don't want to talk about. That's what we really want. But how come we're so afraid to admit it? Because someone might find out, I actually like being in love. I actually like being in a relationship. I like being around friends where I can talk and cry and laugh and just be myself because I'm so busy being full of shit most of the time that I'm tired of it. That I just want to be able to relax. Well, wait a minute. 
That means that you're spending all this effort not relaxing, not being who you are. And I'm not talking about, you know, just, uh, if you don't like me, I don't really care. It's my kind of Rocky Balboa, right? <laughs> if you don't really like me, I don't care. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about we're so afraid to let other people experience it. Yet I found some of my deepest relationships with both men, women, uh, men and women. I mean, my brothers that are clearly, well, you know, I'm an only child, so that's, you know, I don't mean brothers and family. I mean, brothers yeah. and family are because I cried. I shared with them. I said, man, I'm going through hell in a handbasket. I don't understand this. I'm working through this. And with all my knowledge, I'm still dumb as a brick. Maybe we can work through this together. And those relationships have lasted decades. And that's the people that you get to feel most comfortable with. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. What if you just felt comfortable with everyone? Now, again, I'm not talking about altruism and doggone it, people like me and oh, kumbaya. What I'm talking about is you being comfortable with you. Because if you come out of the shadows of yourself, what I call the beautiful darkness, when you come out of the shadows of yourself, there's this gorgeous being that's there and you will see your life change on a dime. It just whoop, changes it's all by funny, itself. You know, we talk about uh, when we talk about how to solve the equal opportunity or or some would say I was listening to Joe Rogan this morning and, and he had Ben Shapiro on and he said it's not equal opportunity. It's equal equal outcome. When you're trying to figure out who you are and how and what your life is supposed to be and living an authentic to be self, to who? it doesn't matter your race, your background. Everybody is capable of doing this, especially in today's world. I mean, come on, you you and I are the same age here. We grew up. There was no internet. We Don't pull me up home. with you. I'm only going to be forty nine. <laughs> I'm only forty nine. Oh, I, all right. Oops. Damn it. I thought I had a year on you. No. Well, you do, but right now we're going to be joined at the same time for 49. <laughs> In November, I'll, I'll have a year on you again. But right, until fine, that time, fine, we're 49. Fine. <laughs> but we grew up with rotary phones, right? Da 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 da. I mean, and I'm like, so now today's world, you can literally, and, and this, this pandemic, as odd as it is, has really given everyone an opportunity to go, well, wait a minute. Am I really attached to what I thought was important? Getting the freeway, doing the same thing I always did, and going back to that? Or can I stretch myself? Can I maybe go to the academy? Maybe I can learn how to create something. Maybe I can start a podcast. I've done more podcast interviews in the last 30 days with new podcasters than I've done in the last three years. Well, yep. people who are established podcasters like yourself, I was like, well, that's fascinating. What made you start it? And I asked them, what made you start it? I thought, well, I'm at home. Why not? I'm like, great. What a great idea. Take yes. the adventure of it. It's a story. And start thinking of it this way, family. If someone was writing the story of your life, is there two or three decades where you were at the same job doing the same crap? Is that the story of you? Is that really you? If your answer is no, which most likely it is, start looking at the next chapter of you. What is it you want to experience next? Not be, experience. What do I, I want to experience travel. Go, pack a backpack, get an RV, do whatever, get a band of merry gypsies and go down the highway a la you know, Willie Nelson. Experience it because regrets the ultimate undoable thing. You can't do it over. And when you sit there and you start thinking, well, I've got to pay the bills. I've got to do that. There are countless stories and examples that have been told, Hollywood including, Into the Wild, a great movie, um, Emil Kirsch did that movie. Yep. Great true story of people who have said, wait a minute, you know, one of the greatest lines in that movie, I felt more alive and my day was filled with enriching experiences when I was penniless. That is a powerful statement for a young 24-year-old male to make. And when I heard that statement, I went, shit, I think he's right. So, for example, I'll use Kilimanjaro. That six days of my life changed my world. I wasn't about, I was off the grid. There's no cell phone service on Kilimanjaro, by the way. I'll save you a lot of time. There's no helicopters. There's no, but wait, you know, it's up there. If you die up there, you're dead. You deal dead. with it. You know, you know, Everest, same concept. You know, it's the seventh tallest mountain in the world. Oh, okay. But those six days, I was present. Every step, every breath, every thought. I was there because you're not talking. You're trying to breathe, literally breathing. You become very aware of your breath because it's, it's laborious. It's, I mean, it's 19,341 feet. We're you talk about it. what you want out of life. In that moment, like you said, you wanted a breath. Yeah, that's all I was interested that in. That was the most important that, thing. And it was such experiential because I could feel breath in my body because, again, oxygen is very depleted. But also, too, you get to face yourself. Because you're, you are there. You're with other people, but you're not distracting with other people. It's you in the mountain. And the mountain's been there a billion years. She's the queen. She's the queen after. She ain't going nowhere. If you're placing your bets, I think you're in Vegas. I mean, uh, you're, you're betting on the mountain probably. 
yeah, Mount, Mountain's taken a few more than, than she's let off. And it becomes this wonderful symbiotic relationship. And I've had millions of those stories. So start looking at what do I want to experience? And then look at the architecture of what keeps you from not doing it. Again, go back to the knot and it helps because your brain's already built for the knot. So when you start unwinding what the knot is, it comes to a natural peaceful state and whatever's left is a good place to start of what you want. Now you're not fighting yourself. It's so the challenge. advice for people tomorrow, today, mm -hmm. what can I do today? Obviously, um, they can go learn from you uh, and, sure. and follow the program. That's sure. probably the best. That's one, um, that's one choice. But today, I mean, if they feel overwhelmed because maybe they don't, you know, they just got fired or, or they just broke up with somebody, you know, maybe there's multiple layers of things happening right now. Where Probably should they is. start? You start with yourself, but what does that mean exactly? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what we do. Uh, and this is, I'm one of those guys that, you know, uh, says, uh, it's like driving a car. Most people go experience the car. They'll drive it around the block. They'll ask a couple of questions before they purchase it. How come we don't do that when it comes to self-investment? self-transformation, self-development, pick your title, I don't care what you want, self-architecture. So our model's different. Go to architecting360.com. I'm gonna give you the first three days of the jump. Everybody goes to the jump training, no matter what. It is your undergrad experience, for lack of definition. The first three days, you will experience tangible, bona fide, real results. And I'm not talking about fake-isms, like, oh, well, I just changed my mindset and doggone it and positive mental, no, I'm talking about Bang, I'm gonna nail you. I go right to the deep end of the pool. That's why it's called the jump. Because you jump in the shower, jump in the car, but now you're gonna jump into your life, like right now, because time's short. In those first three days, if it resonates with you, then you get to make the choice, not a decision. You get to make the choice, I'm willing to proceed with the architecture of my life and lifestyle and start the, and start the journey to own uh, and change your life. And you can do it in 30 days. It's not rocket science, right? You can go further than that, but the first 30 days really makes tangible smack results. And if not, stop. But at least you went in and you jumped in, you experienced it, you viscerally understood it, you, got, you get some good quality knowledge from it, real experiential sequencing, and then if that works for you, go. If not, go. Go experience it, but stop prohibiting yourself from experiencing things, especially if you think you know it all. One of my favorite ones is, well, I've done that self-development. No, you haven't, because the moment you say that to me, you haven't developed shit, because you're yep. still in the space of you think you know it all. I know I don't know anything. I'm good at what I do, which is architect, and beyond that, I'm dumb as a brick. I'm a student of life. I want to experience it. I want someone to come and say, hey, do you know how to do this? Nope. You want to learn? Yep. Can yes. you teach me? Let's go. Right? Let's do it. And I Great. love that experience. Right? Many of my students now who are, I've got students all over the world. I'm blessed for that. But they're also my teachers too because they've taken what oh, I've yeah. taught them in architecture and they apply it to their gift. And I'm like, wow, that's really cool. And then you really learn cool. from that. Yeah. Yeah. That, to me, that's a sign of a good teacher. That's where I finally got worthy of what, you know, the mantle of being teacher was that my students were now teaching me. And I went, crap, now I finally have become a good teacher. But it took me another 15 years to figure out what that mantle actually is. Sure, it's like philanthropy. It. You give and you don't realize you get more than you yeah. give. Oh, yeah. It's, again, I'm, I, again, I'm a drug addict. I love watching these people wake up. I'm constantly... It's just like, wow, wake up, show me what else you're doing. That's great. What are you creating? Where are you taking it into places I would have never have thought myself because I don't know what I don't know, but you know it. Great. Let's go do it together. Can I walk alongside? Can I be a mouse in your pocket and check this out? And it's yes. And so it becomes this very cooperative society. And I'm not talking about, in, you know, a commune or, hey, we're all living out in, you know, in a gypsy world, although that's fun too. It's you understand the value of that person. And, you'd, and it comes, so if someone says, hey, Travis, you know, I'm thinking about uh, doing a podcast. Great. You need to go call Kelly. She's massive successful. At, I, don't, I know radio. I don't know podcasting. I don't do podcasts. I'm a guest, but I'm not a podcaster. Go talk. And you're not going, well, but Kelly, if I send them over to you, you got to give me an affiliate fee. Oh, <laughs> shut up. Just stop. Stop. Get Just, out. Yeah, God, knock it off. Kelly, this is one of my students. They want to be in podcast. Do it. You guys do whatever you do. Be successful. Make boatloads of money. Affect people. Have a great journey. Hey, once in a while, send me a postcard from whatever you're doing. Yeah. Because you understand that's not your journey. Anyway, stop being possessive of it. Let it go. Yeah. Let it go. And have the, the fun. The point, with it. I think that is the point today. I mean, experience it. It is dig deep, but it, it shouldn't feel overwhelming no. or a bunch of psycho bullshit Battle. or that it's, <laughs> it's going to be... Um, you know, too heavy, you should see it as you're going it's to unlock, you're going yeah. to let shit go that you've been it's holding up here. Yeah. Once you have a blueprint, it's easy. You know what the next step is. You know how to do it. You have an entire community around that will reflect and help you do it. But more importantly, you get up every day and you have a passion purpose and you're on point. You know where that, when you have that, then it's different. 
right? World becomes a different place. When you have a blueprint and you understand that blueprint, you have a set of wealth skills that will reflect in the riches of your life. That's money, that's relationships, that's time, that's experiences. That's what makes you rich is your wealth skills of understanding how to architect your life and your lifestyle. Now you're wealthy. It can never be taken from you. And that is what we're about. And then again, taking that wealth and applying it to the education because what if we actually did this now for real? What if this became a real educational process where we taught people to be on passion, purpose, and point as a way of life and make their wealth them? The riches are reflected in what they become from that wealth. That's what It's so about. funny because when you do that, the wealth comes. Instantly. The, like that. Done. Done. Uh, Boom. And that's fact, what I try to oh, say to my funny. kids. Stop uh, talking and, and, about the money. Stop talking uh, about funny. having yeah, your own private jet or whatever bullshit you see on oh, social rented. media. Do something you love to do, and I promise you, you'll have whatever the things are that, that you and think you need. And even if you, you don't have them, somebody along the line will go, I see what you're doing, Kelly. I really align with what you're doing. I really think it's powerful. They'll give you the car. They'll give you their jet. Because people who have that kind of space don't care anymore because they've already achieved it. So right. it doesn't have to look the way you think it does, family. And if yep. you tell the universe, God, Yah, Allah, Allah, Yahweh, Jesus, whatever your God is, you tell God what it's supposed to look like, okay, this is gonna give you your answer. But what if it shows up and it could be a whole lot better than your little brain and my little brain could ever possibly imagine because there's something bigger out there. What, we call that great spirit or great architect. But what if it looked totally different? Then you're allowing the adventure of it all. You're allowing it to be bigger than you thought it could be. Or you know what? Sometimes it doesn't need to be bigger. It needs to be right where it is. And stop telling the world, the universe, it's got to look this way and only then you're going to be happy because the only person that's getting screwed in that deal is you. And you're hypnotizing yourself to believe that you know everything in the universe of how it's supposed to show up. And if that was the case, family, you'd never have coincidence. You'd never have deja vu. You'd never have that moment where you meet that person and your whole body lights up electrically like, what the hell just happened? You'd never have that experience. So what if we just step back and, and surrender to the concept that maybe there's just something a little bit bigger going on in our being than what's going on in our brain? When you do that, life can take on a different thing. I love it. I love it. I've so enjoyed talking to you. I could talk to you all day, by the way, Absolutely. but I know you have stuff to go to. And um, I, I think everybody listening today was super motivated and, Thank you. and definitely want to want to take that jump. So I hope everybody moves forward. I do. I do. I, I hope you do too. If not, well, then thanks for listening for me babble for a little while. Whatever. <laughs> It'll just be you and I still being the, yeah, the I had a great ones conversation. in the room with a clue. Yep. I had a great conversation. This was a good way to start my day. I'm grateful. I enjoyed so my hour. So there Absolutely. you go. Absolutely. Me too. Well spent. Thanks, Travis. Thank you. I wish you the best. Dr. Travis, regular Travis, whoever <laughs> you want to be. Uh, I, 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 I'm super grateful for you being on the show. Thanks. Thanks for letting me be. I appreciate it. it okay. Great take experience. care. All right. Bye-bye. Better change up your perspective. Your perspective. It's something, it's something new. Hope you guys enjoyed the show today. Remember our little talk before the show? Yep. Don't forget to subscribe, like, follow, share all that jazz. It matters, people. You matter. Thanks again for listening. See you soon.